The seventh India Today Conclave addresses the subject of leadership for the 21st century and hopes to bring the best minds together to discuss, debate, and offer solutions to issues that plague the world. Over the next two days and 13 sessions, key policy makers, thinkers, and captains of industry and business will dwell on the subject of leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, before we begin, may I explain the House rules? For all our sessions, we follow the same formats that we've used in the past. We have two or more speakers in each session with a chairperson or moderator who will steer the discussion, which will end with a Q&A session. We have microphones available on the floor with our ushers. Uh, however, do wait for the chairperson to indicate the order in which the questions will be taken. Our opening keynote address on what it takes to be a global leader features the Chairman and Managing Director of Reliance Industries Limited, Mr. Mukesh Ambani. And to chair the session, we have the Managing Director of McKinsey India, Mr. Adil Zainal Bhai, who's been with McKinsey for over two decades. In addition to often advising various governments on economic development issues, Mr. Zainal Bhai primarily works with Indian companies on their growth strategies with an emphasis on globalization and transformation programs. May I invite both Mr. Ambani and Mr. Zainal Bhai to please join us on stage. May I invite Mr. Zainal Bhai to please introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, good morning. I was told that uh, 10 o'clock in the morning is a pretty early and brutal time to wake up Delhi. So uh, we hope that uh, we can make this session as interactive and exciting as possible for you as we go along. Uh, what I thought in terms of introducing Mukesh, who actually needs no introduction, uh, is to give you uh, just literally five minutes on some thoughts about global leadership and the kind of global leadership that we expect to see over the next few years, both in terms of companies and in terms of individuals. Okay. And in that context, I'll introduce Mukesh. So Mukesh, if you can wait for two minutes, I'll uh, then introduce you properly. Thank you. Okay. I'll quickly let you see some pictures and then you know, we, every wave of globalization that has occurred has seen the emergence of new kinds of global leadership in terms of companies and institutions uh, and people that I'll talk about. So I want to talk quickly about companies and then I'll talk about individuals. In the 60s and 80s, uh, uh, 60s, 70s, we saw a wave of American and European companies go around the world and those brand names today, we don't even question that they are global. They came out of uh, their individual countries and they've become global companies. When the next wave of globalization occurred out of Japan and uh, Japan and Korea and Finland, uh, we saw some other companies that became global leaders. Uh, and so it should be no surprise that today, as India, China, Russia enters the global environment, that we will start seeing Indian, Chinese and uh, Korean companies become totally global. I'm giving you some examples over here, and I'm sorry if I've missed some of the folks in this room, but you know, we will, it should be no surprise that in the next 10 years, we will see companies emerging from India that are global. What I wanted to talk about uh, as companies and leave a thought for you is that the companies that are going to emerge as global leaders going forward, in fact, will not be just about financial performance. Uh, in the business world, we always look at what the total return to shareholders is or market cap or something else. But really, the truly great global companies that will emerge, we believe, and you can see it happening in this environment, will do more than just have great financial performance. They will improve society around them and people's lives around them. Uh, they will create a new way of doing something. It will not be the same old businesses. It will not be the same way that they've done it. And they'll build lasting institutions. There will be many companies that will have great returns they might not survive or they might not last, and they may not have the kind of impact that you'd like to have in a globalizing world. So I think the challenge as we look at companies and therefore the leaders who drive them is are they set up to in fact not just provide terrific performance, but in the process of doing that, or perhaps get performance as a result of improving society and people's lives. 
as well as create something new and build lasting institutions. So I'm going to talk about these two things. I've talked a little bit about the kinds of companies we'll see. Let me talk for two minutes about leadership, the individuals who will drive some of these companies. So let me quickly define a leader. If you put any measure of performance, uh, impact on society, impact on people, impact on performance, impact on an industry, leaders create breakthrough performance. Managers provide uh, very good performance and predictable performance, and leaders provide breakthrough performance. So those are the folks that we're talking about. Sorry, going back. <clears throat> not a well-recognized business leader. Uh, but the point I want to make as I show you the next three slides is it's very tough to have one kind of leader that you'll expect to see running these companies. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, fallacies that we make is to say that there are certain characteristics that define a leader and they will be very common. Quite often, they have very distinct characteristics and are made by the situation. Many folks have all of the characteristics that you would expect but then in the wrong place at the wrong time or they're not in the right place at the right time. And therefore, their leadership qualities don't translate into performance. If you take Winston Churchill, whom we all know, uh, and I, I'm sure you all have all read the history. He was a failure many times over until the Second World War, where he rose to you know, greatness and immediately after the Second World War, he lost the elections. So there was a set of situations and context within which he rose to prominence. And in a sense, you could apply some of that logic to what we're going to see in global companies and business leaders, which is it's the environment and the context within which these leaders will shine. Uh, when faced with a challenge is when we will see these leaders come up. Okay. So I'm going to skip the next two because I don't need to explain it, but there are different kinds of leaders who face different kinds of challenges. And quickly go on to this. It's very difficult to find a leader, particularly of organizations and institutions, that at the end of the day doesn't know how to lead self and lead others and lead the business. And so I would argue as we look for the kinds of leaders that we go forward, these leaders will have the capability to mobilize and change a large number of people. That the scale of institutions and companies that we're going to see going forward will in fact be so large that unless one has the capability to lead a large number of people, they will be unable to make a difference in the businesses and the institutions that they are in. Okay, so I've just talked very quickly about uh, giving you a perspective on leaders, but let me talk about global leaders. Okay, what is additionally new about global leaders? And I'll link this again to the situation. I'll give you one example. All of you have uh, seen in the press that the head of Nissan, Carlos Goshen, has come to India and is going to establish a large plant. Carlos Goshen was a wonderful manager and a great leader, but his real prominence came when he went to Japan and turned around Nissan, right? So in a sense, he rose out of that occasion, and this is the kind of leaders, in a sense, who can work across uh, countries and have a mindset from day one to change it. So let me start on that, which is perspective, character, savvy, and mission. One, perspective. How do they look at the world today? Uh, they embrace uncertainty, they balance tensions, and they understand that this world is not going to be a one which they can predict. And in a sense, if we look at what's happening today, uh, at least in the Indian market, we were just discussing before, you know, industrial production is going up or down depending on what you believe. The markets are going, uh, you know, uh, overcorrecting or uh, going back to where they should be. There's tremendous uncertainty in India and others. In this uncertainty, we think global leaders thrive. They have a perspective that allows them to do that. Number two, they have a strength of character. Uh, they <clears throat> understand what they're trying to do, and they have a very strong emotional connection to the, what they're trying to do, and they demonstrate unwavering integrity. We'll talk about that. <clears throat> Third, at the end of the day, and perhaps in India, this is the easiest to describe, as somebody once described this to me, and I hate, uh, please don't take this in the wrong way. Uh, they said, listen, you know, we look at every opportunity. We are from Gujarat. We understand where the money can be made in this. And in a sense, linking great global trends to basic business savvy and street smarts that allow you to figure out what the real opportunity is. Uh, Mukesh, I chose that example. 
specifically for you. And they are able to garner organization support. And I think the fourth one, which I think is actually quite critical, that, uh, that I think one has to look for in leaders, is at the end of the day, they have a sense of mission. And their mission isn't about making money. Uh, it is about creating something, as I talked about earlier. And I think in the global world, they have a mission about changing something, either in their countries, either in their technologies, either in the businesses they are in, that will fundamentally help shape uh, the society around them. So I think these are the four things one should look at as one looks at business leaders. Okay? Now with that, I would like to introduce, I'll skip through all of this wonderful stuff and get to introducing Mukesh. Uh, as somebody, I think in my introduction, uh, you mentioned that I've been at McKinsey for two decades. I think Mukesh has been in uh, <clears throat> thinking about business for five decades. <laughs> I was just saying that five decades sounds a lot older. Two decades sounds a lot older than 20 years. But uh, And in that time, uh, I think as uh, Mukesh has looked at the world, he started thinking about global competitiveness from day one. Uh, before the Indian economy was unshackled and before many companies started thinking about how do you establish global leadership, uh, Mukesh and the Reliance Group started thinking about how can we be competitive worldwide. And at a time when nobody thought about establishing world-scale plants in India of this magnitude, uh, Mukesh not only planned for it, but actually was at Jamnagar helping uh, on all the details to open the refinery. I had a chance to visit Jamnagar and I understand it's now becoming the largest greenfield uh, uh, complex, petrochemical and refining complex in the world. There is no one place which has as much refining and petrochem capacity in the world and this grew out of Mukesh's view of global leadership. Starting from nowhere, uh, okay, uh, Reliance is now among the top five producers of petrochemical products in the world and on many of them including uh, PVC and others he's soon to become among the largest if not the largest uh, <clears throat> and from a standing start of not uh, being involved in upstream uh, you know if you look at the size of companies and the size of the gas strike uh, there is no question that uh, he has thought of building up a upstream company that will be among the most prominent in the world so I think in a sense, as we talk about emerging global leaders and global leadership, Mukesh, I think, fits many of the characteristics I talked about, which is when you talk to him, he never talks about making money. He talks about the mission of improving people's lives. And by the way, in the process of doing that, he is not averse to making some money. <clears throat> but he never talks about making money. He talks about a much broader sense of mission. Number two. Uh, I'm always amazed at how much he knows about what is happening in markets around the world uh, that at some level you'd wonder why he would want to know that. But I think he just has a very open mind around the world so he can tell you what is happening to uh, light heavy crude differentials on the Gulf West Coast or how the strike uh, uh, new gas find in Sakhalin will affect uh, gas prices in Europe. Things that many people who have been following this for a long time uh, may also not have thought about the linkages. So I think he has a yearning for the global kind of knowledge that we are looking for in this. And then finally, I think uh, Mukesh is, uh, I, if you heard him speak in front of his employees, uh, you'll see, and, and uh, customers, you'll see that Mukesh is, uh, you know, can excite his employees and motivate his, the people who work for Reliance to be true partners rather than employees. And a set of people who work as hard as uh, the folks they work and what has motivated are tough to find, and that is part of uh, what I think makes Mukesh special. So Mukesh, without going into your family history, may I invite you to give us the Reliance story. Thank you. Thanks, Adil, for that uh, introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be with you at the India Today Conclave in 2008. Arun, uh, thank you for this opportunity and for this honor. Four years ago, the India Today Conclave 2004 had the theme of building 
and India century. And at that time, I had addressed the question, can India become a G5 economy? Today in 2008, the conviction that India can very well become a G5 economy is much stronger. Today, I would like to address the question, how can India as a country join the ranks of world leaders? How Indian businesses could rise to global heights? Before I present my main theme, I would like to make two preliminary observations. First, about the much-hyped talk about the number of Indians in the world's billionaire list. This, in my view, is a deceptive distraction. It is like Maya of Indian philosophy. It veils your vision and comes in the way of knowing your real self. To all those who have aspirations of global leadership, I would like to caution, beware of this titillating illusion. And to my friends at India today, I hope that we have heard Adil loud and clear. And the next time you do a cover story on Mukesh Ambani, it will not be the money machine, right? It's much beyond that. Second, my presentation to this August gathering draws heavily on my involvement in the making of Reliance. From what I learned from our founder chairman, Sri Dhirubhai Ambani, my father. And these learnings have great relevance to my theme today. Because within one lifetime, Reliance rose from scratch, from a thousand dollar company to become India's number one private sector company, the first Indian private company in the Fortune 500 rankings, and a company which aspired for global leadership in all its areas of business. The values, principles, and the roadmap which enabled Reliance to achieve these heights have been tested in the teeth of tough competition and heavy odds. I share them with you and the young generation of Indian entrepreneurs who I see plenty in this audience in the spirit of humility and with a sense of responsibility to India's future. Ladies and gentlemen, global leadership in culture, knowledge, technology, as well as business is not something unknown in Indian history. I do not want to take your time on India's past achievements in mathematics, medicine, discovery of zero, and numerous other branches of knowledge and scientific gyan and vigyan. I will only focus on economy and trade. Till as recently as 1700, China and Europe accounted for similar share of world income. Each of India, China, and Europe had 23% of the share of world's income. A large and vigorous skilled workforce in India turned out not just cotton, but luxury items of a wide variety. Consequently, the economy produced a fabulous financial surplus. India enjoyed 25% of the share of global trade in textiles then. The annual revenues of the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb in 1659-1700 are said to have been more than 10 times those of his contemporary Louis XIV of France. By the early 18th century, India was a leading manufacturing country in the world. India at that time had 22.6% share of the world's 
GDP. There was a large commercialized sector with a highly sophisticated market and credit structure. It was manned by a skillful and in many instances a very wealthy commercial class. Methods of production and of industrial and commercial organization could stand comparison with those in vogue in any part of the world. India by then also developed an indigenous banking system. Its bills of exchange were honored in all major cities of Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, these facts have not been conjured in the mind of someone obsessed with India's glorious past. These are recorded by respected global economy historian, Professor Angus Madison. He has painstakingly constructed the structure of the world income over the past three centuries. By the beginning of the 19th century, however, India's share of the world economy began to decline gradually at first and then more steeply. Its share of the global economy reached a low point of around 4% in the second half of the 20th century. Then we lost the edge, and so did China. Once again, in our present time, the wheels of history are turning. In the next 25 years, two-thirds of the world's GDP will come from emerging Asia. I believe the 21st century is poised to become an India century. The favorable combination of factors is before the whole world. India is the fastest growing free market democracy. Since 1991, India has achieved one of the highest growth rates in the world. 67% of its population is below 35 years of age. While other countries are aging, India will continue to be young. Our workforce will increase to 760 million by the year 2025. All of you are aware of these facts which confirm the prognosis that India is well on the way to becoming a major economic power. Let me, however, put in a caveat. Nothing in the life of a nation or a company is inevitable. And when opportunities knock on the door, the outcome will depend on whether we seize them effectively and in time. India is once again at such a crossroad in her checkered history. The outcome will depend on one crucial factor, leadership. Therefore, we need to redefine the meaning of leadership in all walks of life. I will focus on business leadership because this is the subject of my theme today. Friends, to define the meaning of business leadership, we need not go far. We only need to dip into our own civilizational values. In our tradition, a businessman is called a Mahajan. Going by this definition, a business leader is a great man, not necessarily the richest man. From ancient times to the days of Mahatma Gandhi, a business leader in India is mandated to act as a trustee of society's wealth. And then Mahatma Ji gave us the mantra, when you are in doubt about a step to be taken, think of the last man in the queue and ask yourself how it will affect him. There cannot be, to my mind, a more profound definition of what goes by the term inclusive growth. And when we were also told, Mahajano Yan Gata Sapurush, the preferred road is that which a great man has traversed. It highlights the crucial role of 
business leadership. Are these only cliches? Are these mere sermons? Are these unrelated to the aspiration of Indian businesses to become world leaders? I strongly believe these concepts are of immediate, urgent, and practical relevance today. Ladies and gentlemen, for Indian businesses to become world leaders, it is not enough to be financially successful. They must have knowledge leadership and regain the edge in science, technology, and innovation. They must have human leadership, the ability to nurture talent and sustain it. And above all, they must have moral leadership. The world is becoming weary of businesses which are obsessed with short-term gains, ignoring the heavy cost of ethical and moral degeneration. The consumer today is alert, the investor is sagacious, and people demand exacting standards from business leaders. India has always emphasized moral elements in all business conduct. It is time that she rises once again by those enduring values and provides moral leadership to a world yearning for change.